how Camilla won over the Queen and became the Duchess of Cornwall. Painted as an interloper in the wake of Prince Charles and Diana's divorce, Camilla Parker Bowles underwent an image overhaul before her 2005 wedding. In an adaptation from her book The Duchess, Penny Jr. documents Parker Bowles's road to the Isle. When Sir Michael Pete arrived from Buckingham Palace in 2002 to take up the job as Prince Charles's private secretary, he came with a clear agenda. His instructions from the Queen were to sever Charles's relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles because it was a mess and was detracting from his work. This is certainly how the people on Street James's palace who worked with Pete during those first months viewed the situation. Camilla had been the prince's mistress. He'd all but admitted to having an adulterous affair with her, and now she was sharing his bed, his house, and his life. And she was being seen in public by his side, but not as his wife. For a man who would one day lead the Church of England, this was an awkward situation at best. She had to go. It didn't take Pete long to realize that this was an impossible dream. The prince would never give up Camilla, no matter what. And so Pete rapidly changed tack and, with the zeal of the freshly converted, became the loudest, fiercest advocate for their marriage. While the prince's former deputy private secretary Mark Bolland had laid the groundwork for it, Michael Pete was the man who made it happen. But there were obstacles to overcome first. It needed not just the Queen's permission but customarily that of the state, the church, and the great British public. The Prince of Wales really is the most curious character. In his usual way, he was dithering. On the one hand he had stood his ground against his parents the media, and the voice of the nation in making Camilla non-negotiable. A man who for decades had dedicated himself to duty, to doing the right thing, suddenly put everything he stood for and had worked for in jeopardy because of Camilla. On the other hand this wasn't the first time he had needed to be persuaded to do the right thing by her. I don't think the prince was happy with the way things were, says a former member of the team, but he couldn't see a way of making it work. He'd been through a lot of bad times with the public. And I think he was probably nervous about putting himself back in a negative situation, damaging the monarchy, and he didn't know whether he could persuade the Queen to accept her. I think he thought all of these things insurmountable, and he really didn't know what to do. The prince is too diffident and nervous, and I think he was scared. Marriage was the only way their relationship and the prince's reputation would be able to move forward. Michael Pete went to the prince and told him very clearly that either Mrs. Parker Bowles must go or he must marry her. They could not, under any circumstances, go on as they were. And he gave Charles the confidence to believe it could be made to happen. Someone else who was key in persuading Charles was Camilla's father, Bruce Shand. He was then in his late 80s, and although he loved the prince dearly, he thought him weak, and was worried about how vulnerable he had made Camilla by allowing her to live in limbo. Bruce took him aside and said, I want to meet my maker knowing my daughter's all right. Charles adored Bruce. He loved the whole extended Shand family and in turn they were very fond of him, but Bruce spoke for them all. They felt that Camilla's situation was precarious and a bit unfair, and although she herself had never wanted marriage in the past, things were different now. She felt herself to be neither one thing nor another and was secretly grateful to her father for putting pressure on Charles. Having been at Buckingham Palace for nearly 15 years, where he had been close to the Queen, Michael Pete was the perfect person to pull all the essential strands together and iron out the complications. He was well acquainted with the Queen's private secretary, Sir Robin Janverin, and Janverin being sympathetic to the prince, was willing to offer helpful advice to the queen. And although Tony Blair, the prime minister, had been the one to christen Diana the people's princess, both Blair and Janverin appreciated how important Camilla was to Charles, a stark contrast to Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin's reaction to Edward VIII's relationship with Wallace Simpson, for whom Edward abdicated the throne. The final component was the church which then frowned upon second marriages if a spouse was still living, as in the case of Camilla's former husband, Andrew Parker Bowles. The solution was a civil ceremony with a church blessing. The staff at Clarence House, the royal residence lived in by the Queen Mother before Charles and Camilla moved in, felt that the greatest challenge was how a marriage would be received by the public. A populist poll had shown that 32% of respondents would be in favor and 29% against. 38% didn't care, while 2% had no opinion. As one palace advisor put it, they knew the media would be aggressive, 
because it was like someone taking their ball away that they'd been playing around with in the back garden all that time. Colleen Harris, the prince's former press secretary, agrees. They'd all made a lot of money out of the story that Camilla was this evil, horrible person who ruined Diana's life and was ruining the children's lives, and they wanted that story to continue. The more we made Camilla acceptable, the less the story had traction. The idea was to make her more human without making her more popular than him. We didn't want any of that rivalry again, to show she was a real person with real feelings and interests. At Burke Hall, a 53,000-acre estate in Aberdeenshire, Scotland, over New Year's 2005, Charles asked Camilla to marry him. He had spoken to his mother, his sons, and the rest of the family when they were all together at Sandringham for Christmas, which Camilla had spent with her family. Robert Jobson broke the news of the engagement in the London Evening Standard but it didn't spoil a thing. Clarence's house was ready to go. They had a target date, but they knew the secret was unlikely to hold, and Paddy Harverson, the prince's communications secretary at the time, had devised a media plan covering every day for three weeks just in case. And bless him, Robert Jobson broke it on the one day that was the best day of the whole three weeks, Harverson recalls. There was a charity ball that night at Windsor Castle. They were both going to be dressed up in their finest. It was a complete coincidence. Perfect for us. Imagine if it had been a day when they weren't going to be out and about or seen together.